Please let's pick up our scriptures and turn to Galatians chapter 6. You may tell somebody that it's not time to sleep or you may tell yourself too. <laughs> you may tell yourself that myself, listen, it's not time to sleep. It's time to hear the word of God. Hallelujah. Amen. A couple of weeks ago, it's not quite up to two weeks um, in the morning, I wanted to do my Bible study, but I was and I'm still in a particular book in the Bible, in the Old Testament, where I was doing my studies, but I just had this urge, this feeling in me to check some things out, uh, not even knowing what's there, so I just opened. Um, that week, there is this um, Galatians chapter 6 that came up on the Bible app um, and so I just went there and read what was the verse for that day even though I had what I was studying so when I read it it's a passage I've read before I'm sure some of us have read it before um, it caught my attention and then I kept on reading and the Lord was speaking to me about what I was reading to the point that I now got up and actually picked up my computer and started writing and so that really occupied the whole study time that I didn't even bother going to the place I was studying so I knew that the Lord was speaking to me about that passage and that is the word I want to share with you this morning the message is titled your responsibilities to your pastor and your spiritual leaders your responsibilities to your pastor and your spiritual leaders let's open our scripture to that galatians chapter 6 we're going to read from verse 6 to 10 are you there galatians chapter 6 verse 6 to 10 let him who is taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches verse 7 do not be deceived god is not mocked for whatsoever a man sows that he will also reap for he who sows to the, his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption but he who sows to the spirit will of the spirit reap what will he reap everlasting life verse 9 let's let's read it together verse 9 and 10 everybody let's cross it together we can read on the screen to remain on the same page let's go and let us not grow weary while doing good for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart verse 10 therefore as we have opportunity let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. May the Lord bless the reading. In this passage, the first thing that I want to bring to your memory or to your attention is the church is the house of God. How many of us believe that? The church is what? The house of God. Apostle Paul reminds us in his writing to Timothy that the church is the house of God. Timothy was a young pastor. So when you read the book of Timothy, there were a lot of information that Paul was given to Timothy about the church because he was a young man of God. And there in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, I'd like to read it to you. Watch what the scripture says. 1 Timothy 3, 15. But if I am delayed, Paul says, I write to you that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God. The house of God is the church of the living God. The church of the living God is the house of God. The pillar and ground of the truth. So first thing this morning is the church is the house of God and you must not forget that. And so because the church is the house of God, God has given the church instructions, guidelines, principles on how his church is to be run. If you have a family, it is natural for you to have some guidelines that guide your house. Let's say you have two or three kids and maybe they are, you know, five, ten and whatever. You might say, well, you, you do this chore in the morning. You, you vacuum. You, you do this. And everybody knows, you know, what to do. Even sometimes you might tell the, elder, the older one, you go pick up your brother at the bus stop at this time. And so what goes in your house is determined by you. Guess what that means? If the church is the house of God, God has given guidelines and instruction about his house. Let me give you some example. And in this example, you will see instructions, guidelines, and responsibility. For example, in 1 Timothy chapter 3, 
verse 1 to 7. God gives the qualifications for anyone that wants to become a pastor. You can read it at your own time. First Timothy chapter 3, 1 to 7. God talks about the family life qualification. He says, if you want to be a pastor, the word there is bishop. Um, the, the Greek word for bishop is episcopos, all right? And that's where we have, you know, the Episcopal Church and things like that. Bishop just really means an overseer. Somebody that watches over and rules over. So it's really the same thing for a pastor. Some churches say bishop, some people use pastor. Understand the scripture. A bishop is not greater than pastor. It's just different words for the same thing. Amen. All right. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, God says, if anyone wants to be a, a, a bishop in my house, here is the family qualification. Here is the character and behavior qualification. Here is the ministerial qualification. From verse 8 to 13, he says, if anybody wants to be a deacon, he says, here is the family qualification, character qualification, and ministerial qualification. Why? It is his house. And so, in the scripture, there are rules and regulations and responsibilities. Now, in Acts chapter 20, verse 27 to 28, I want us to turn there, turn there this time. You're going to see the role of a pastor. In this book, we are turning to, they are called elders. Elders. It's also referring to pastors. All right? And so, um, Paul was talking to some of the leaders of the church. Here is what it says, verse 27, Act 20. For I have not shown to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Therefore, take heed to yourself and to all the flock among, the, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Do you see that again? Episcopus come up again. Even though we are told these people were elders. So they are not elders in the sense some churches say, these elders, so elders, so. In this sense, they are actually pastors of the church. Take care to do what? To shepherd the church of God. Everybody say shepherd. Paul says, shepherd the church of God which God purchased with his own blood. Shepherd means to feed. It means to guide. It means to care for. Have you ever seen the picture of a shepherd and, and sheep before? Paul says, you elders, he called all the elders because he was going to die soon. And he said, I'm not going to see your face anymore. And he gave them the last instruction. He said, make sure you perform your responsibility. Feed the sheep. Care for the sheep. Guide the sheep. That is the role of a pastor. I want to add one more. Do you remember that time when Jesus resurrected before he left? What did he do? He told Peter, do you love me? Anybody remember that passage? And Peter said, yes, Lord, I love you. What did Jesus say? Feed my sheep. The second time, Jesus asked him, Peter, do you really love me? He said, Lord, you know I love you. Jesus said, tend my lamb. That means care. The first time, feed them the word of God. The second time, care for them. And then number three, do you love me? Peter was upset. He said, what Jesus, what? Jesus was getting to something in his heart. He said, if you really love me, feed my sheep. What's my point? In the Bible, you see clearly the role of a pastor defined. What is the definition of the role? Feed. Care for the sheep. Feed them the word of God. Three times, Jesus told Peter, if you love me, take care of those sheep for me. Praise the Lord. Now, you know what? The Bible tells us now the responsibility of the sheep to the, to the shepherd. That's what I want to talk about today. The role of the sheep to the shepherd. Our time is limited, so let's see um, how far the Lord allows us. Now, go back to that Galatians chapter 6. This is one of the roles of every church member to your pastor. It doesn't matter what church you go to. He says, let him, Galatians 6, 6, let him who is taught the word, the one who is being fed the word, should do what? Help me now. Let's read it together. Let's read it together. Let's read it together. It's in your Bible. Let him who is taught the word do what? Share in all good things 
with him who teaches. The first thing you see here is giving to your pastor or your spiritual leader is a responsibility. Amen? You know how we know? The verse says, let. In the English, it's an instruction. In the Greek, it's an imperative. In other words, it's a command. It's a command. God says, look, I've, to I've told the shepherds, I told Peter three times, don't play with those sheep. Feed them for me. Now, as it were, he turns to the sheep. He says, hear your instruction. Because the whole thing is my house. Both the shepherd and the sheep belong to me. Let him that is being taught share, that is, give in all good things. To who? The one that is teaching. The first point is, giving to your pastor is your spiritual responsibility. Says the Bible. If you are a Christian and you go to church and you have a pastor over you or a spiritual leader, it might not even be a pastor, it might be an evangelist or whatever, but that person is the one feeding you spiritually and you hear the word of God for them, from them, one of your responsibilities before God is to give to that pastor or that spiritual leader who feeds you the word of God. That is the first thing. It must be clear. Just as the pastor is mandated to feed you, you are mandated to give to him. Let, let us look at another passage. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17. Are we there? Or we can have it on the screen for us. Watch this. I find it interesting. See, when you study the scripture, everything always connects. Watch this. Let the elders, precipitous, which is also still referring to pastors. Let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of what? Especially those who labor in the and same thing. Paul says, let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of honor. And if we are confused. Let me narrow it down. Particularly, especially those who stand before you and feed you the word of God. Next verse. Let's read the next verse. What does it say? For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain. Right? And the laborer is worthy of his wages. I want you to notice a few words here. Number one, it is another command. How does it start? What's the first word you read in that verse? Let is an instruction. Now, let me, let me confess this at this point. I, I, I think it's good. I have read these passages before. I'm sure many times. This will be the, and I'm sure these passages have been preached many times over in the world. But I want to make a honest confession. I have not actually had it taught this way that I'm teaching it. And that's not to mean it has not been taught. I just haven't maybe put myself in a position to hear it. And secondly, I have never taught it that way. And so, I, I actually brought my own understanding, uh, my mind to understand that, okay, so there's, I didn't know this. That's just, I don't have to tell you that, but I did anyway. But that is why you study the word of God. You learn. You learn. You learn. So the first thing is that it is a command for every church member. It is a responsibility before God that you give to your pastor or to your spiritual leader. It's not a suggestion. It's an imperative. God commands you. Look at, notice in this passage, it says, it is your spiritual leader's right to receive from you. You know why I said that? It calls, it says, laborers and wages and worthy. How many of us work? How many of you go to work? If you go to work at the end of the week, is it your right to get paid? Yes or no? Help me now. Why? Because you are a laborer. You are laboring and you need your wages. You don't get a gift. You get wages. That's what is in that passage. He said a laborer is deserving of his wages because he's laboring in the word. 
He said, especially those who labor in the word. Notice that I didn't say it is your pastor's right to demand from you. I didn't say that. Hear me very clearly. What did I say? It is your pastor's right to receive from you. Why am I making that clear? I'm sure other people will hear this word beyond this church. The word of God must be clear. God never commands any pastor and say, well, because you are laboring in the word, demand. You must give me. Uh, 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 uh. That is a violation of the word of God. God doesn't say, if a person comes to you and says, well, I'm the one that is preaching the word of God to you every time. Uh, I cannot pray for you now except if you go and write a check. Ah, that is robbery. God doesn't say that. So it is not a, a pastor's right to demand money from you. But it is your pastor's right to do what? To receive from you. It is the word of God. Praise the Lord. Is somebody listening to me now? Do you know that the Bible actually calls everyone, every child of God that goes to any church and you have a pastor? Do you know the Bible actually called you a debtor to your pastor? Let me show you. Let me show you. Romans chapter 15, verse 25 to 27. Romans chapter 15. Make sure nobody is sleeping around you. Verse 25 to 27. Are we there? Now let's read it. Let's read it. But now this is Paul is going to Jerusalem to take offerings to the Jewish Christian in Jerusalem. That's the background. So he's talking to the Gentiles, the Romans, about what he's about to do. So now, but now I am going to Jerusalem to minister to the saints. For it pleased those from Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor among the saints who are in Jerusalem. It pleased them indeed, and they are their debtors. Why? For if the Gentiles have been partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also to minister to them in what? Their duty is what? Help me now, it's on the screen. They are du the duty of the Gentiles is to what? Minister to those that minister them to them spiritually in material things. Here's what Paul is saying. Your Bible came through Jewish people. There's nothing you can, they cannot. Moses was a Jew. Elijah, all of them, mention all of them, they are Jews. That's just the way God chose it. And all the apostles were Jews. And so Paul was saying, all you Gentiles, you are Christians now, but it is the Jews that gave you your spiritual um, blessings that you have. God used them, and they are in Jerusalem. Paul says, I'm going there now. Some of them are poor. It is your duty. You owe them because they gave you the spiritual blessing. Jesus was a Jew anyway, so there's no controversy. Even Paul, I'm one of them. He now says, if their spiritual blessing, your Bible, the prayer, the word of God, the revelation of God came from them, it, you owe them to give them your material things. You are debtors. That's really what the Bible says. You know what that means? When any Christian sits under any pastor and that pastor feeds you spiritual things, you become a debtor to them financially and materially. That's what the Bible says. Praise the Lord. So notice the word, debtor, duty, minister, material, material. What does that mean? It means it is your responsibility. And anyone hearing me, whatever church you go, I don't, it doesn't matter what church you go to. As long as you are fed by that minister, it is your responsibility. When was the last time you walk up to your pastor and say, Pastor, here, take this envelope. God bless you, sir. That's what the word is saying. When was the last time you asked yourself, what does my pastor look like he needs? And you went and got it and you gave it to him. That's what that word is saying. Praise the Lord. When was the last time that you ministered to the needs of your pastors? This is what this word is challenging us to do. It is in the word. And so what the word of God is saying to you is, as a child of God, as a church member, as somebody that maybe even you just go to a fellowship, the, the place you go to is not a pastor. The guy is just a fellowship leader and he just, but every week you come, he has the Bible, he reads it to you, he, he preaches the word, you say, well, they have not made him a pastor. But why do you keep going there to get spiritual blessing from him? Do you see? 
Do not just look at your pastor wearing the same shirt week after week after week in whatever church you go and it doesn't bother you. That's what the word of God is saying. Don't just look at your pastor. Maybe he wears the same shoe or wears the same jacket or wears the same whatever week after week and you just come, you get a blessing and you go. Paul says, no, you are debtor to that man. It is a duty for you to bless that man spiritually. That's what God commands. Don't go to church, receive prayer, receive the word of God and, and take your Bible and say, Pastor, that was a good sermon. God really used you. And then you left. Uh-uh. It is unbiblical. That's what God is saying. He says, minister to your pastor materially who minister to you spiritually. Praise the Lord. Amen. Now, it is possible somebody might say, well, hey, pastor, I go to a big church and my pastor is blessed. My pastor doesn't need a dime from me. In fact, if, if anybody should give anybody, my pastor should be given to me because I know the car, right? I know everything. I, I mean, we, we see what goes on in the world, all the complaints people make and everything. I'm still going to preach the word of God anyway because I'm sent to preach the word of God. I'm not sent to echo what the complaints of the world is. If you are wrong, the word God of God condemns you. If you are using the money of the church and people and extorting them and twisting their hand, you're going to face God. That's your problem. But we need to hear the true word of God. Now, so listen. Somebody says, Pastor, I hear you very correct. But my pastor is super blessed. I don't need to bless him. If my pastor is not wearing good shoes, then maybe. But he's wearing good shoes. So why do I need to bless him? Let me give you this illustration. A few years ago, I was waiting on the Lord for something very important. Very important. So I went into three-day fasting and prayer. Serious. This, this is not like uh, prayer you pray on the sideline. I really, really wanted God to do something. So first day went, nothing. I mean, God didn't say anything to me, whatever. Second day went, nothing. Third day went. At the end of the fasting, before I would break the fasting, I was still expecting, God, are you going to say something or respond? This is serious. So the third day went, nothing. Not even a dream, nothing. So I was now kind of delaying that before I go eat, how can I just do prayer like this and nothing? So where I was sitting in my bed, I just dozed off. I don't think it could have been more than two minutes. I didn't even know when I dozed off. Immediately I dozed off, right there, I went into a dream. Now, listen very carefully. In the dream, I saw this man of God. He's a man of God that I know. In fact, without mentioning him, he lives here in this state with me. So this is not imaginary. Somebody that I know personally, you know, that I saw in the dream. And the man walked into my house in that dream, and he was saying, Pastor, I'm hungry. I need to eat. And he was mentioning what he really wanted. So in the dream, number one, first of all, this person is not somebody that needs anything from me. He's somebody that is blessed. So, but as I saw him in the dream and he said he's hungry, immediately in that dream, I said, oh, I have something for you. In fact, I have that very thing you want to eat. And I went there in the room and got that thing. And as I was giving to him, I woke up. And there is no question. I understood what God was saying. What God was saying. God was telling me through that dream that I've had your prayer, but take an offering and go and give to that man of God. I didn't have any question. I understood exactly what God was saying. And I texted him and I said, you know, blah, 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 blah. And I sent an offering to him. Why? Listen to me. Your giving to your pastor doesn't matter whether the person has or doesn't have. Did you hear what I just said? This is my personal experience. By the grace of God, I'm a man of God. The person is a man of God. It doesn't exempt anybody. God says, but he's a bigger, like a spiritual father to you. Take an offering. After three days fasting and prayer, give it to that man of God. And that's what I did. So when you say, well, my pastor, has, uh, his jacket is fine. It doesn't look like something. You don't break the word of God. Praise the Lord. It is a responsibility. Hallelujah. Did you know that Jesus actually sent the apostles out and he told them, don't take any money bags, don't take anything? Did you know that? He said, don't take any money reserve when you just go out. Why would he do that? Let's look at it. Open your scripture to Matthew chapter 10, verse 7 to 13. Matthew chapter 10, verse 7 to 13. Amen. Make sure you open your scripture there. I want you to read together. 
Are we there? All right, verse 13. This is Jesus talking to the apostles. As you go, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Pause right there. See that last statement? That's why I told you that according to the word of God, there is no place in the Bible where any man of God can stand and say, I want to bless you now, but first come and drop offerings here. It's a violation of the scripture. You know why? Jesus said, the healing that you're going to give, I give it to you freely. Don't charge for it. The blessing and the miracle you're going to give, I give it to you freely. Don't charge for it. If you charge for it, you will vomit that money. That is the problem we're having in Africa and other parts of the places and all these tricks and everything is completely unscriptural. But I'm going further. So, Jesus says, don't charge. But now watch this. Verse 9. Provide neither gold nor silver nor copper in your money belt. Take nothing with you. Right? No bags for your journey, no tonics, no sandals. Don't even take extra pair of sandals. Don't take staff. Don't take anything. My question is, how are these people going to feed? Okay, Jesus, you said when I get there, I shouldn't charge for the word. I shouldn't charge for the healing. And I shouldn't even take any extra thing. How am I going to leave? Here's the answer. For a worker is what? Worthy of his food. Verse 11. Now, whatever city or town you enter, inquire in that city and town who is worthy there. And stay there until you go out. And when you go into the household, greet it. If the household is worthy, let your peace be upon, come upon it. But if it's not worthy, let your peace return to you. You know what Jesus is saying? Don't take anything to you with you. Why? Because it is the responsibility of those that I send you to, to take care of you. That's what Jesus is saying. Do not charge them. I didn't give you, I didn't charge you to give you the gift of healing. So don't stand there and say, go and bring me the paper for your car before I heal you. It is sin. But he said, whichever person that I send it to you, I send you to, it is that person's responsibility to put money in your purse, to put sh shoes on your feet, to put clothes on your back. Everything that you need, they must take care of you because I send you to them without a charge. It is your responsibility to take care of those that share the word of God with you. Hallelujah. So, don't go to church anymore. Take your Bible and go. This is not only limited to this church. Any child of God that is listening to me, it is your responsibility to clothe your, the man of God over you. It is your duty. It is your duty to shelter the man of God, teaching you the word of God. It is your duty to minister to the need of that man of God. That's what the Bible says. Now, we're just limited on time. I will see if it's possible to compress the other two points that I have in the time we have. Now, it's not only a responsibility, it is a responsibility and principle that activates blessing. Praise the Lord. I say what? Praise the Lord. It is a responsibility and a duty that actually activates. What? Blessing. How many of us here wants to enjoy the blessing of God? Let me show, see your hand. I mean, I mean financial blessing right now. Yeah, I mean, God is taking your picture. If you don't want, that's fine. That's it. <laughs> but if you, want to act, if you want to enjoy financial blessing of God, let me tell you, how does it happen? Jesus tells us. It has to do with what we are saying. Turn your scripture, Luke chapter 6, verse 38. Let's look at it together. Luke chapter 6, verse 38. Praise the Lord. Are you there? All right. I think it's on the screen for us. Now, no question. The person speaking here is Jesus. Let's read it together. Let's go. Give and good measure, press down, shaking together, running over, will men, well, add to your bosom. The first thing I want to notice here, that I want you to notice in this place, what? Is the abundance of what Jesus says he wants to give to you. How do I know? Look at all the words. Number one, he said, give and it shall be given to you. How? Good measure. Now, now, take your mind back to Africa. You women, you went to, you go to the store, you want to buy a bag of rice or whatever. And they, they weigh that thing with the cup. And you say, 
Mama, make the thing, you know, don't, don't, don't remove from me. Let it be the right measure. Jesus said, it will be given to you good measure, but it's not finished. Then what does he say? Press down. Can you imagine the picture now? He said, Mama, shake the thing and press it down so you can add more Gary on top, right? Jesus said, that's what I want to do. I'm going to press it down so there can be more space. Then what? After it is pressed down, it's shaking together. Shake it that you will fill all the hole so that, what? I can still add more on top of it. And then when you now add on top of it, you make a heap and then it will be doing what? Running over. You get the picture? Jesus says, that is the way God wants to bless. That's what's in the scripture. Praise the Lord. So when I ask, how many people want to be, to be blessed? Jesus said, there is a principle. There are two principles in this scripture. Number one is that to receive, you must give. That's why I said it's a responsibility with a promise of blessing. Jesus says to the disciples, you want to receive? The principle is you must give. Number two principle is here is that you will receive according to what you give. Amen. Let's read it together. For the same measure that you use, help me finish it, it will be measured back to you. Praise the Lord. You know that there are many children of God that they don't give. And they, want, they pray to receive. God says, no, it doesn't work that way. And Paul says, especially to the people of the household of faith. Let me show you one more passage uh, on that second point. Second Corinthians chapter 9, verse 5 to 7. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9 to 7. Watch this. Therefore, I thought it is necessary to exhort the brethren to go to you ahead of time and prepare your generous gift before and which you had previously promised that it may be ready as a matter of generosity, generosity, not as a grudging obligation. But this I say, he who sows sparingly, help me finish it, how does he finish? Will reap bountifully. Is that what your Bible says? How will, how, how will the person reap? Sparingly. And he who sows bountifully, we also what? Paul is just repeating what Jesus said. If you want to receive, you must give. And then he says, in fact, you must give to the man of God right there in front of you. And so, kind of winding down as much as possible. Go back now to Galatians chapter 6. The principle of give, receiving Financial blessing is given. You cannot violate the scripture. You can't. Now, watch this. This was interesting to me. Galatians chapter 6. Now, verse 6, we've read it. Let him who, taught, uh, who is taught in the world share in all good things with him who teaches. Verse 7. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man sows, he will also reap. What do you think that means? It means two things. When Paul says God cannot be mocked. What Paul is saying is that you cannot disregard the principle of God which is not to sow and expect to receive. That's what Paul is saying. Jesus said, you want to receive, give. Paul now says, but don't deceive yourself. Don't think you can disregard the instruction of giving and expect to receive. He said, God cannot be mocked. So, one, every believer that wants to receive financial blessing, the Bible says you must give. You cannot disregard that. Number two, you cannot mock God by hoping that you will receive what you didn't sow. There are two things. If you don't sow, you will not receive. But you cannot expect a bountiful harvest even if you sow sparingly. That's what I mean. For whatsoever a man sow, that will reap. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. There are many children of God that do not give or sow into the life of those whom the Lord has set over them, yet they are expecting financial miracles. That's who Paul is talking about. Paul says, it doesn't work like that. Listen to me, every believer listening to me anywhere you are. The key to God blessing you financially, one of the major keys 
is blessing that man of God, whoever he is, whether he's poor or rich, that God has set over him. That's the principle of the scripture. Did you know that some financial miracles in the Bible that we read, they happen when people ministered to the men of God? Yeah. In the Old Testament, let me share two with you. I might not read all the passages because of time. The first one that I'm sure some of us know is the widow of Zarephath. Remember, the Bible says there was three and a half years farming. No rain. Everything was dry. God now began to supply the need of Elijah through the raven, right? And the brook. The Bible says the brook dried up. What did God now say? God said to him, Arise and go to Zarephath, for I have prepared a widow for you who shall provide for you. And then the man went there. And he met the widow and said, woman, uh, please, can you get me water? I guess he was testing the ground. <laughs> Maybe the woman would say no. So the, the Bible says the woman was going to, and, and as the woman was going, she said, wait a minute. In fact, when you are coming, please bring me a small cake. And the woman said, ah, man of God, I don't have any cake. Oh, all I have is a few, a little flour and a little oil for me and my son to eat and to die because there is famine. Elijah said, ah. Oh, Okay, you see that little that you have? First of all, make me a small little cake. All of this is, is in First Kings, but I didn't want to read it because of our time. And bring it to me. For thus says the Lord, the pot of oil and where you have your flour will never run dry throughout. And what did the woman do? Okay, I mean, we might as well give it to you because it's the last drop to eat and... No, she believed and she did it. And the Bible says, and they ate for many days. Throughout the famine, the woman was sustained. Here are some questions I want you to ask. Why would, who was providing for Elijah before this woman came into the picture? Who? God, through the ravens. Second question, did God run out of resources in heaven before he now sent this, this man to the widow? Do you think God was no longer able to provide? So number three, why did God all of a out of all people, send the man to a widow. To a widow. Now, if you're going to tell somebody to go get help, would you send them to a widow who, has not, who is gathering sticks? Why? The reason is that God wants to show us that in whatever situation you may be, the law of giving and receiving still applies. Amen? God said, I'm going to show you, go to the widow. The widow could have said, well, hey, there's, no, there's nothing. God says, I want to prove that no matter how rich or poor you are, the law of giving and receiving still apply. Number two, who really was blessed? Was it Elijah or the widow? You know what? God was providing for Elijah. If, if Elijah doesn't go there, <laughs> the man was going to be okay. But God says, I want to help that widow out because she will die. That is why God sent the man of God to the widow. What God is saying is that the key to receiving is what? Giving. Amen? Amen? The second example. The Shunammite woman. Praise God. Everybody remember the Shunammite woman? She's not a widow. She was rich. The Bible says affluent. The Bible says, she noticed that a man of God, Elisha, passes by. And one day he said, she said, man of God, stop by and eat. Okay? The man stopped by. If you have time, go and read it. The Bible says, she persuaded. The word there is, she pressed him until the man eat. The man was not going to eat. He said, you must eat because I perceive you are a man of God. After a while, she now said to her husband, this man that stopped by and eat, why don't we just create a small room for him where he could lay his head? And they did. One day, Elijah, Elisha said, what does this woman need? The man said, I, I have money. <laughs> I don't need anything. Gehazi said, yeah, she has money, but she doesn't have a child. And the man said, by this time next year, you will what? You will have a son. Let me ask you a question. Why a rich man, a rich woman this time? You know what God was showing? God is showing that there are some, some people that they have money, but they, have, they need what money cannot buy. 
And God is saying, use what you have to get what you cannot buy. You understand? The woman had money. She said, I'm going to take, you man, take care of you, man of God. And God said, I will do it. The third thing in that passage is that God was revealing through the story of that woman that sometimes long pending answer to prayer get released when you give. Somebody listening to me? The woman has been wait, looking for the child blessing of the womb for many years. She's old. She's a believer. That's why she recognized a prophet. And God is looking at her. And when that story happened, God says, God is telling the believer, I said, sometimes a prayer that has been long pending will be snapped when something goes from your hand to a man of God. 25 years, Abraham was waiting on the Lord. What brought the release of his blessing? He saw three men. He said, ah, you must eat today. They said, we are not eating. He said, no. The same, see the similarity. He, the Bible says he persuaded them until they say, we will stay. What do you think God was saying? That is God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They wanted to test his faith. He said, no, I don't know who you are, but you must eat. When they finish eating, God now said, go and call your wife. But the man has been praying and fasting. Let me tell you the key to it. There are many children of God, listen to me, in many churches, that they are praying, they are fasting over some things for a long time. And God says, the key to releasing that thing you are asking for is, go and open your hand to that man of God. That's why you have the story of Abraham and the story of the Shunammite woman. That's why. One was poor. She wasn't praying for anything. She's going to die. God says, you will not die because you give. One has money, but she's been praying, but there is no answer. God says, if you give to this man, I will answer your prayer. And instantly, she had a child. Here, this is critical. Listen to this. I don't know if I will, excuse me, get any response because of what I'm about to say, but it's important. There are certain denominations. Listen, everybody. There are certain Christian denominations that are given the grace of prayer. Are you listening to me very well? And nobody questions it. Everybody knows that if you go to that church or that denomination, there is fire of prayer there. But the downside is that things are tight there. There isn't much financial abundance there. Let me tell you something. Let me be honest with you. My denomination is one of those denominations. That's why I said what I'm saying is big, and I know. And there are some other denominations. Listen very carefully. That they don't have that grace of much prayer, but money is flowing there. You know what that means? God says, the Bible says, you cannot mock God. Whatsoever a man sows, he will do what? He will reap. Those certain denominations that are blessed, thank God for the grace of prayer. Unfortunately, too many of those churches do not understand the principles of blessing the men of God over them. So you see some men of God raggedy. You see them suffering, and yet they will lift up prayers every day for the church. They will preach every day for the church. They are suffering. That is why God doesn't lift the head of the members financially. I'm telling you an important secret. God says, I'm listening to your prayer, but you cannot violate my principle. Listen, the Bible says in the book of James chapter 5, verse 13 and 14, Is anyone in trouble? Let him pray. Go and read it yourself. Then it says, is anyone sick? Let him pray. That means when you are sick, when you are in trouble, the answer is prayer. But does anyone need blessing? Jesus says, let him give. You don't pray blessing alone. You give and then blessing comes. I want to tell us in this church and any other church that you are listening to me, if you want to be lifted financially, Anyone that you have ahead of you as the one that labor in the word, make sure you take care of them. It doesn't need a lot of prayer. God will lift you up. But when you don't, when you pray for sickness, God will heal you. When you are in trouble, when you pray, God will heal you. But when you pray for blessing, it's closed. 
It's a, it's a secret. That's why I told you when I was sharing this word that, honestly, I've, I wish I had had it taught like that, and I'm sure it's been taught. I just haven't heard it. And I wish I had taught it because, let me tell you something. Men of God, listen to me. If you don't teach your church the principles of giving, you will suffer, your church will suffer. Amen? Is somebody listening to me? You, I'm, I'm sure you've not heard this sermon from me before because it's, I just learned it. Any church, if you don't teach the principles of giving, especially blessing the man of God over you, you will suffer, your church will suffer. And you can pray very mightily. But the very day you teach the church, I'm not supposed to charge you. God doesn't send me to do that. It's a violation. But God says, I should tell you the word of God. You want to be lifted up financially. Bless the man. The day your people know that, they start to do that, your church will be lifted, you'll be lifted. That's why it says, God cannot be mocked. Amen. So please, let's help ourselves. And every believer, wherever you go, help yourself. Because he says, thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treads wheat. That means the one walking out and laboring on the word. He said, make sure you give him his reward. Then I will open the windows of heaven on you. Like that. So sometimes you've heard it when people say, well, uh, blessings and financial blessings doesn't answer to prayer. There is a lot of truth in there. But the two women that I talked to you about, they didn't really pray. They gave. Last example, and you rise up on your feet. Peter, New Testament. The Bible says he had walked all night, right? Luke chapter 5, nothing. What happened? Jesus said, well, can I use your boat? He said, okay, you can use it. When Jesus was done, what happened? Jesus said, okay, now that I used your boat, launch to this side. There was too much abundance. Everybody says, Philippians chapter 4, verse 19, the Lord shall supply all our needs. Go and read it. The verses before, Paul was thanking the church of Philippi. He said, you have sent for my needs. Over and over again, you took care of me. Go and read it. Philippians chapter 4, maybe starting from verse 13. He said, you send for my necessity. Not that I need it, but I seek the fruit that will abound to your account. He now says, because of that, therefore, my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory. A lot of times we quote that verse, but you figure leave everything else. But says, no, 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 no. I'm praying for them because they have obeyed the principles of giving. You will never lack. That's what he said. Let's rise up on our feet.